Dear friends, welcome, welcome to the third in our session of People of Interest. We are really on have with us a very special scholar, Mrs. Rivka Slanem. Let me share with you a few words about her before we jump right in. Mrs. Slanem is the Education Director at the Ruhr Chabad Center for Jewish Student Life and a lecturer on Jewish medical ethics at Binghamton University. A self-described Hasidic feminist, she lectures internationally on the intersection of Jewish observance and contemporary life with a special focus on Jewish women. She serves on the editorial board of the Rohr Jewish Learning Institute and co-authored one of their most popular courses. We are deeply honored to have Mrs. Slanum with us and allow me please to begin first and foremost with a joke and then a video clip here goes as far as the joke is concerned. A Jewish man and a Chinese man are in a bar. Suddenly the Jewish man punches the Chinese man in the face. Ow, why did he do that? Asked the Chinese man. That's for Pearl Harbor, says the Jewish man. But it was the Japanese who bombed Pearl Harbor. I'm Chinese, says the fellow. Chinese, Japanese, what's the difference? Asks the Jewish man. A few minutes later, the Chinese man punches the Jewish fellow. What's that for, asks the Jewish man. That's for the Titanic, he responds. What? That was an iceberg that brought down the Titanic, the Jewish man yells. Iceberg, Goldberg, what's the difference? So hopefully one of the things we're going to do throughout this evening is to get into the nuances of the various fabrics and flavors of Jewish communal life, uh, and I believe that's what brought each of us here tonight to get a deeper insight into a recent popular uh, mini series called Unorthodox. Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, this is a, a clip um, Mrs. Lanham asked me to share with you, I believe will be part of her commentary. With all the uh, strife and fighting overseas, it's easy to lose sight of the turmoil at home. There are hot spots here that are disintegrating into chaos as the world sits idly by. Why it's an act travel to Long Island. Follow this report. We've all heard about the religious structure that's been enraging Manhattanites. Now with similar controversy is engulfing Long Island. Call it a holy war in the Hamptons. Residents of the village of West Hampton Beach says the proposal of an A route is an outrage. That's right. A Jewish Orthodox group has been given permission to erect a religious boundary called an Aru around West Hampton Beach. A structure supporters claim will be harmless. It's just a religious freedom issue. And if your religion requires that Aru, you should be able to do it. But for others, it's an aesthetic issue. It would totally transform the look of this town, which I enjoy. What does an Aru look like, Charles? Basically, you wouldn't even see the thing. It's a matter. You wouldn't see it. You know, because it's a line. It could be a thin line running through the poles in the street around the whole area. It really is almost invisible. Yes, these beautiful seaside power lines will be ruined by this. Wait for this. Over here. them have a string around town. It will attract many, many Orthodox Jews who want to break the rules of their religion. Oh, so maybe the view he's talking about is less this and more this. The Orthodox want an A-roof because Jewish law prohibits performing daily tasks on the Sabbath. Everything from pushing a stroller to even carrying keys. If I were in an A-roof, can I kill a man? Visible, why not just pretend it's there? You can't say it's there, it's not there. You're not involved, it's imaginary to you. But it's imaginary. It's real, but it's imaginary in a metaphorical sense. So it's really imaginary. It's not quite like Alice in Wonderland. It's more like Mr. Snuffleupagus. Uh, I went to West Hampton Beach to save the town before it became a lawless wild west bank. You know, it, it, it allows them to push their carriages, and it's okay. But first they start pushing their kids. Next they start pushing their Orthodox agenda. 
I think that people just need to be more open-minded, and I think it'll all work itself out. I'm not aware that the arrows really. Restaurants like this bakery are going to have to become kosher. This bakery's already kosher. are the hardball tactics the Orthodox are using against the established Jews. One of them tried to explain to me very loudly she could not shop on the Sabbath and then I said to her, take your groisa tuchus, which means very large behind, outside of my store. That's just seems rude on their part. Exactly. They are a very close-minded little group. That's why Charles and the other open-minded Jews created an organization to keep Orthodox Jews out of their town. Whatever you all are doing, it has to be horrible. If you made a 73-year-old Jewish man complain. I envy him because that's the only thing he's got to complain about is that fishing line up there. Boy. From here to California, you can't eat that. Both 4,000 years of shared history, we're choosing to ignore tradition. Charles, we should keep the Hamptons the way they're supposed to be, Christian. Well, I totally disagree with that because the Hamptons are for everyone. <laughs> These folks. Yes, we are against the over our way of life. And the best way to protect your way of life? Make sure Orthodox Jews can't practice theirs. Why it's an act. We'll be right back. I want to begin by saying good evening. Uh, across the pond, it's good afternoon. So that means we have a lot more time because I'm on my time and I've, I'm inviting you to my time. I hope you're all keeping well. I know this is a difficult time for all of us kind of surreal at best and absolutely harrowing for those who have suffered losses. And I'm grateful that we have this type of mechanism to keep our community together and in fact, to grow community. And I asked Robert Collinson to show that clip because uh, I believe it underscores some important truths. A uh, little did I know that he was gonna have trouble um, playing it from the UK. And he, as you I'm sure know, is extremely bright and extremely ingenious. And he found the clip on another website. What I didn't know was, is that that website, afraid of being, I guess, controversial, um, edited the clip, much to my consternation. Because uh, there was something in the original clip I actually wanted you to see. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about it. Um, I played that clip for you because I think context is everything. And in that clip, you can see that the secular Jews of the Hamptons understand their more observant neighbors, not at all. What they do know with certainty is that they don't want them in their neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, this brouhaha over Arab repeats itself from time to time. Uh, and the bottom line is, we don't want them next to us. And yet, uh, as clearly we can see, because we're all gathered for this, and I can tell you, I've been doing scores of these sessions. It's, it's kind of a little interesting. And one day somebody's going to do a study about the study uh, of, of this TV miniseries. It seems like it's unleashed um, interest and fear like nothing else. Uh, so it's just not, it's not just Jews. It's Jews and non-Jews all over the world with a fascination, an insatiable appetite for more information about the Hasidim from a fashionable distance, of course. So Shtisel was exhibit A, and now we have an Orthodox. Of course, Shtisel was a sympathetic treatment of the strange demographic, while unorthodox is a pathos-filled story of escape from the stronghold of Hasidic life in Williamsburg. It has a heroine, of course, the underdog, and the villain, her larger community. And this, of course, makes for very powerful literature and then cinema. Unorthodox is filled with strange customs and traditions. And without understanding the meaning and larger framework of any, any ritual, it's easy to come away with the impression that this is just 
completely bizarre, like over the top, just plain cuckoo. And let's not forget that it's clearly oppressive to women. But as every good anthropologist knows, in order to study and understand a community, you have to go deeply to the core, understand their particular values, their perspective. Otherwise, it's an exercise in futility. But forget about really understanding the community. Let's start with something basic. So if you would have seen the unvarnished, unedited clip, uh, part of that clip was uh, where, where Jon Stewart, tongue in cheek, puts the word Eruv, which is a Hebrew word on the screen, and then he puts an equal sign near it, and he says, from the, um, I'm trying to reconstruct this in my mind, but basically he says, Eruv equals loophole. And this is the kind of thing that was edited out by Aisha Torah because they understand something really important. And that is that for the person who doesn't really understand the concept of Eruv, when they see that on the screen, even though they know this is a spoof, this is going to make an indelible impression on their mind. And now forevermore, unless they are disabused of this notion properly, they will conflate Eruv and loophole. And I think that so much of this is happening with unorthodox. There are all these overt and subliminal messages that are making an impression on people's minds about what orthodox Jewry is like, what Hasidic Jewry is like, and so on and so forth. And so what we really want to do is talk about that. Uh, I don't know how it is in the UK, but here in the US, realtors, people in real estate, always talk about how there are only three things in real estate. Location, location, location. In my business, there are only three things, education, education, education. And I really relish the opportunity to talk with people um, and to learn from them and possibly for me to be able to impart uh, some ideas that I hold dear. So I wanna do something towards helping more people understand orthodoxy and Hasidic Jewry. And I want to say from the get-go, but I'm happy to answer any of your questions. No, we don't all shave our hair off. We don't all have uber-meddling mothers-in-law. We don't all have god-awful sex with long nightgowns on and so on and so forth. Um, and we'll happily go through all of these issues or any others that you have. Um, now, I, do, I just want to say that I understand people are really curious to know to what extent art imitates life. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to add just some contextual points, because like I said, context is everything. So first, as you know, Jews are not a monolith. This is actually quite confusing to people on the outside who actually think all Jews are the same. We, of course, know how laughable that is. Uh, not only, now, of course, let me just, before I say anything else, even as I say this, the larger part of my brain is saying we are all the same. Okay, so before and after anything and everything, we have to understand that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, and irrespective of how they define themselves and how they um, join or don't join, and what they look like and what they observe and what they believe, there is no way for a Jew to be anything other than a Jew. And on the most essential level, we're all the same. But we have perfected the art of differentiating ourselves by veneer. So we have all these facades and we have different denominations and we have different sub-denominations. And it gets even more confusing because um, there's this group of Jews who are ultra-Orthodox. Now, of course, that's a whole different subject as to why any group of people should be called ultra-anything, but I'm not gonna talk about that now. Uh, so then the press has found this sanitized word to use, this Hebrew word Haredi, uh, which literally means those who tremble and is a reference to trembling with awe before God. Um, <laughs> That, that should only be the case that everybody who looks Haredi actually has any or really a, a substantial level of awe of God, but that's for another day as well. Uh, so here you have the Haredi Jews, and now people are like, okay, I got it, Haredi Jews. Oh, no, 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 no. Haredi Jews are themselves differentiated into uh, what people will call Yeshivish or Litvish Jews, and then you have the Hasidic Jews. Okay, got it. No, you haven't got it, because the Hasidic Jews themselves are subdivided into many, many sects. Uh, if I had to guess, and I really haven't added this up, and I haven't done an actual 
historical survey, but I would guess there are probably over 60 different Hasidic sects and less than 10 that are really large and would be the, 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 the uh, Hasidic sects you might hear about or even interface with. And when I say interface, you probably see them on the bus, unless they're Chabad, of course, but that's a whole different um, ball of wax. So with most Hasidic sects, there are a lot of similarities. I would say the distinctions come in very nuanced ways. Um, most of it is really in dress, uh, if, I had to, if I had to really call it. The sharpest differences, however, among Hasidic sects, and uh, not only in dress, that, that's the least of it, uh, but, but really very sharp differences conceptually, philosophically, um, in every single way, is ironically between the Chabad Hasidic sect and the Satmar. Now, having said that, there's much that all observant Jews share, I mean across the board from the most modern Orthodox to the most insular Satmar. Full disclosure, I am not a Satmar Hasid. I have never lived in that community. I do have relatives and acquaintances in that community. And so I know a little bit about the inside of the community. While my life is very different from theirs, I do not intend to throw them under the bus. On the other hand, I don't fancy myself their defense attorney. Uh, what I do hope I can do is provide some balance and some insight. The second piece of context I want to provide, and then we'll get right to your questions, is that it's extremely important that viewers understand that Deborah Feldman's story, which inspired and spawned this mini-series, is her specific experience. It's one woman's experience, which included some very unfortunate personal circumstances, and what the book and the series fails to depict, of course, is the deep beauty, the love, the sense of purpose and mission that pervades Hasidic life, the tangible relationship between each person and God that informs the everyday, the richness of the life cycles, the holidays, and even the quotidian. The vast majority of Satmar Hasidim, the Satmar community, while not living lives you or I might choose, lead happy and extremely meaning-laden lives. And this is true, I might add, for women, just as much as for men. I know, I know, women are classically depicted as baby-making machines with nary a scintilla of brain matter or self-autonomy. I can even understand how many of the scenes in this miniseries basically underscore this perception. But living as a Hasidic woman myself, an observant woman who also defines by feminist, I can tell you that the miniseries, like many other treatments of observant Jewry, doesn't really give the viewer the chance to understand the larger context. It doesn't give voice to the nuance, which is where the truth really lies. Is there dysfunction in that community? Absolutely, yes. Is there dysfunction in every community? Vociferously, yes. But this community is just such an easy, easy target. And then the viewer comes away thinking, oh, this is how all Hasidic people live. Um, one more point I want to make before I get to your questions, and that is that I've been absolutely fascinated by the articles that this miniseries has spawned. Uh, they've come fast and furious. So then there's, of course, been, you know, um, those who laud this series. Then there's been those who are absolutely upset and insulted and uh, really, really taken umbrage and offense at how this series depicts Orthodox Jews and Hasidic Jews. But what has really been of greatest interest to me has been uh, the articles written by people who themselves have left the Satmar community. And uh, that category, very much like the Jews, can itself be subdivided. And you have those who left, and it's very obvious, midst great pain, a lot of rancor, and my heart goes out to them. And I don't for one moment doubt that there have been experiences just like the ones depicted on screen. I don't doubt that there could be couples who struggled with dysfunction. I don't doubt um, that there are people who had a parent who was uh, an alcoholic who suffered shame and so on and so forth. I don't doubt that and my heart goes out to them. But then you have the much smaller category of articles written by a smaller demographic of people who left the community and have still retained a beautiful tie with their past. And while that's not exactly how they live their lives, they haven't thrown it all away, you know, the baby and the bathwater. And that's why I, I think those articles are very, very important. And they themselves are irate 
about the way this miniseries depicts their community. They left the community after all. So, you know, um, they're not out to defend it necessarily, but they feel like I do that there was no dimension that with the exception of Esty, the chief protagonist, all of the other people depicted just are so wooden and caricature-like, and there's no joy, there's no warmth. Um, the, the realness, for lack of a better word, is, is completely taken out of it. And um, the, the show doesn't capture the heart and soul and the spirit and the profundity. And before I take your questions, I'll just say that for me, there's really only one time in the show where you at last get to see the inner landscape of one of the people aside from Esty. And at last, the show lets you in to the great secret that Hasidim actually do have emotion. And that's when Yankee, her hapless husband, cuts off his paya in a show of ultimate devotion. And he, he just wants to show that he really wants to be back with her and he wants to meet her halfway and he'll do what it takes. Uh, but aside from that, it's, it's really a shame. Okay, made my point. Now I wanna see the points you're making. What are your thoughts about the way in which people who wanna leave are treated? Are they to choose between living a lie or having the kids forcibly removed from them? Uh, this is a very, very important question. Um, let, me, let me begin by saying this. And I, I think, I hope you'll understand what I'm saying. Every parent hopes to give their child the best in life whatever that might be, and whatever definition they have in their mind, right? That's what every parent wants to do. There was a time, not even such a long time ago, where children didn't dare affiliate with a political party that was not their parents' political party. You know, this ran in families, that's the way you did it. You didn't even root for a team that wasn't your parents' sports team, okay? We don't live in those days anymore. But the reason that was so important is because it was seen as an offense to the elders in the family. You're gonna choose something else. So now imagine when you have a community where religious observance is not an aspect of life. It is the actual fulcrum of life with everything funneled through that perception, okay? So who you are, why you are, what you are, when you are, it's all about Jewish observance. And when you have a child who rejects that, who repudiates that way of life, there's just a tremendous amount of hurt and upset and worry and so on and so forth. Uh, and now the question becomes, how best to deal with this? Now, the Satmar community is a very insular community. It was built to buttress itself. That's how they built it. They built it as a fortress uh, to kind of um, keep the world at bay, the larger world at bay, okay? So it's especially uh, offensive, but, but on top of that, they really have very few tools to deal with somebody who's coloring outside of the lines. There's very little margin, there's very little latitude for someone who doesn't toe the straight line. And uh, every effort is made to kind of keep the children inside of the community and bring them back if they leave. Um, in previous sessions I've done on, on this mini series, people ask, was it just because she was pregnant? I don't believe it was just because she was pregnant. Of course, that upped the ante, but I think that any child that tried to leave uh, would be met by that same kind of resistance and um, they would take very, very, perhaps even aggressive measures. Now, a very different model of this is to uh, accord every child, even those who want to leave, as painful as it might be, uh, a safety net and a community that will embrace them and stand by them no matter what they choose to do. And in that model, you get um, most of the time a much better result. And even if the child is going to, quote unquote, break ranks with the actual observance of the family, but they will always be part of the family. And uh, I think it's important to understand that in most cases, there is so much beauty in this lifestyle that they will make their way back, maybe not perhaps in exactly the model that their parents foresaw, but in some model. And having to break the tie completely is, is, is very, very unfortunate. 
Uh, let me make sure I, I'm, I uh, so do you have to choose between living a lie or having the kids forcibly removed? So this is a very, very good question. Um, if I'm going to be honest with you, which I'm going to choose to be, I think that there are, uh, I don't know what the numbers would be, but there are probably people who live within the community who do live a double life uh, for whatever reason. They just don't have the moxie uh, or whatever it takes to, to actually break ranks. And also because as I explained in this particular community, it's all or nothing most of the time. Um, it, it really is a terrible severance on every level. And it, that's not for everybody. Not everybody can do that. Um, would people have children forcibly removed from them? I think that's very complex. And I think that differs from situation to situation. Um, in a situation of dysfunction, I would think that the courts would look to see who is the functional parent. Uh, but I don't want to gloss over the fact that the community would bring a tremendous amount of pressure to bear uh, that the child be kept in the observant community, if at all possible. Uh, I understand what you say about unorthodox being one person, but there is nuance. But what I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable is the structure and the hierarchy that can underpin such experiences, especially for women. How do you see this as a feminist? Um, so. I could do, you know, a whole other um, presentation on Jewish women and Jewish law and so on and so forth. And like I said, I'm keenly aware of how this looks from the outside. And it looks like, you know, these women, if they are smiling, they're just, you know, slaves smiling in the sun. Uh, so I want to just disabuse you of that idea. The women and the men in this community, like I said, are living meaningful lives. Uh, there is a hierarchy, but that's not specific towards women. Uh, there is a very strong rabbinic um, authority, and that's something that we're not used to in the Western world, where, you know, we believe that each one of us basically has the right to live exactly as we choose. And while that's true, ultimately, for every human being, but inherent in living an observant life is a uh, subservience, if, if you want to use that word, to authority. There is a higher authority than myself whether I am a man, whether I am a woman. And if I am the highest authority in my community, there is still a higher authority over me. And ultimately, there is the ultimate authority over everyone. Uh, so it's a very, very different point of departure. And uh, I, I, I hope that I, I, I've explained just a little bit to you. In other words, it's not, ultimately, it's not about whatever the hell I want to do. Uh, I'll put it differently. People talk about finding meaning in life. Uh, meaning is a very malleable term. It's very, very subjective. So if somebody finds meaning in collecting beer cans in the 1960s, who am I to obviate the meaning they're finding in that, even as I'm rolling my eyes, right? And that's why from the perspective of Judaism, it's not about meaning as much as it's about purpose. So the question is, every day I get up in the morning and I say, what is my purpose? Why did my soul come down into this world? What do I have to do? And so the hierarchical um, system is meant to guide in that purpose. It's not meant to cut away at a person's self-expression. Now, this is true that in some communities, there is more latitude for self-expression uh, and, and, and there's less in other communities. Uh, could you please recommend good books or articles about the different branches of observant Jewish branches? We'd be very interested to find out about them. I'll do that afterwards with your, um, with your permission, Maxims. Uh, what is your view on the religious communities in various parts of the world which have flaunted the social distancing rules during the pandemic and have wedding, held well, like over party celebration whilst risking lives? Uh, I'm, I'm very agitated about that. Um, I think just to be fair, I would also add that similar kinds of things were happening during Easter, similar kinds of things were happening in Manhattan Central Park on just any given Sunday, similar kinds of things were happening in Manhattan when people were watching a flyover formation. Um, and I think this just um, points to the fact that people who are used to communal life and observant Jewish life is extremely communal are going to have a very hard time pulling themselves away from that at all times. Um, but I, wanna, I want to just you know, flip it for a moment, okay? These communities are communities where a person might have a family of eight children or 14 children for that matter. They may have 91 or 210 first cousins. Uh, they're, they're not able to go to the weddings. They're not able to go to the various happy occasions. In other words, I think it's true. You see these pictures on TV, but what you're not seeing 
is the tremendous extent to which this community has actually curtailed what is the bread and butter of their everyday life. It's really hard to understand if you're not living in that kind of community, but um, in that kind of community, you could be invited to six to eight weddings in one night. And I'm not giving to hyperbole here. That's just the way it is. So yes, they haven't been able to control themselves in every single instance. Uh, most notably, there was one very high profile funeral. Uh, but again, it's a measure of a certain type of life. I'm not trying to massage away what happened. I'm not making excuses. I'm trying perhaps to just bring you into their heads a little bit. What do you think about organizations such as Footsteps or Mavar who assist those who leave? Um, I think those, those uh, organizations serve a very, very important uh, purpose. Everybody needs a bridge. Um, I don't uh, know if anybody from one of those organizations is listening in, but if they are, I would love for those organizations, uh, in addition to helping people who leave these very insular communities uh, get their you know, GDEs and um, give them tools for navigating the secular world, to also speak more to their spiritual landscape because um, those who leave, like every other person in the entire world, they have a really deep need for spiritual connection. And um, if they could be kind of given tools for navigating that and understanding that it's not one or the other and that there are so many, many shades and ways in which they can still continue uh, to foster a robust relationship with God. Uh, this is a good question. What's something positive that you took away from this series? Hmm. Uh, have to think about that. <laughs> Uh, I really, I really have to think about that. I'll come back. This is based off someone's real life experience. How can we judge it? Filled with pain and topics that don't, the Haredi look good. It's truth for someone. Yeah, I, I, 100%, uh, this is based, in, it's, it's kind of a composite of different people's experiences. And like I already said, there is a lot of pain in life, not just in Williamsburg, not just in Crown Heights, not just in Golders Green. There's pain and dysfunction in all people's lives. Um, and every community wants to make itself look good, but every community has to acknowledge that there is an underbelly and that we have to do what we can for all the members of our community. What would you like to see in a narrative film that takes place in the world of ultra-Orthodox community? Huh. So that's an excellent question, Mayor. Um, here's the problem. The problem is that the beauty and the richness uh, of everyday life is not going to sell. Nobody wants to watch a movie that's boring. Uh, because everybody's kind of doing okay. So we all understand that for literature and cinema, you need to have this kind of tension. Uh, what's unfortunate is that so many people are getting the, the entirety of the Jewish education off of films like this. And, and this is really kind of to everybody's detriment. Does the hierarchy through lineage prevent positive change within the community? That's a very, very good question. Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, Yaakov, uh, I think there is a propensity in, the, in rabbinics, uh, but that's true in so many other areas as well, uh, for a little bit of nepotism or a lot of bit of nepotism. And um, maybe, maybe that doesn't always bring the best results. Um, you know, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be honest, on the other hand, it brings, it does bring a lot of uh, rich qualities to it. Can you touch more on what you know about the divorce laws in this community? Um, you know, first, I just want to say that people like to say that um, in observant communities, people don't get divorced because divorce is such a stigma. And, and while I think that's changed quite a bit over the last decade or so, I think there's still a much uh, lower incidence of divorce in very observant communities. And when you say it's a stigma, you have to ask, well, why is it a stigma? And it's a stigma because it happens so infrequently. And now the question is, why does it happen so infrequently? So it's tempting to say, well, these kids are just thrown together. It's like Fiddler on the Roof, two fathers in a room at the back of the butcher shop. And one has a son that's hard of hearing. And the other one has a daughter that's lame and mazel tov. They put the chuppah up and now we have a new family. And there's no way out because there's no divorce, which of course there is. It's not the Catholic Church. There is divorce. And it's very clear that sometimes a marital union will not last. Um, but what I think is very important for people to understand is a little bit about what goes into marriage um, and to say it differently, you know, what the courting or the dating would, would look like. 
So in the mini series, you saw a very, very particular um, model. It's called the Basho. And in this model, the young people see each other for a very short amount of time. Now let's look at the back end. The back end is parents who have asked about this young person who are looking for a suitable match for their child because in these communities, people are not dating recreationally, okay? So they're dating for the purpose of marriage and in at least in other Chabad, in the Chabad community and in other Hasidic communities, not, maybe not necessarily in the Satmar, people can date 30 people before they find the person they feel is their partner in life, but they're gonna be dating with serious intent. And therefore, they're gonna look into like, who is this young person? What are their values? A little bit about their personality. So when the two people finally meet, you have a fighting chance that it might work. You know, Charles Darwin uh, uh, commented that man breeds himself with less concern to pedigree than he breeds his horses. And it's true, I constantly look around myself, I've been on a campus for almost 36 years, you know, everybody's hooking up, um, you know, where are you gonna find, well, you know, I'll walk into a bar, I'll walk into a club, I'm gonna fall in love, like it makes it sound like you're slipping on ice. Um, so these young people in these communities are dating very, very purposefully, and they're looking to climb in love with someone. And so therefore, there's a tremendous commitment to the marital union, a tremendous commitment. And sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes there are very, very clear reasons for why it doesn't work. But it's going to be less frequent, which is why, yeah, I think there is a little bit of a stigma attached to divorce in these kinds of communities. Uh, but the other side of that is it points to what really is the ultimate value in these communities. And when two people meet, they're looking to kind of grow their, um, their love for each other from the inside out. Sorry, but isn't it just beyond cruel to cut off ties with people who don't believe? Yeah, I, I don't think anybody should cut off ties with people who don't believe. And uh, I think, and I actually, I know from at least two cases that even in the Satmar community, that's changing and more and more parents are, are not cutting off ties. Um, but very often, you know, the pain is just too deep and it's just too real. And not everybody is perfect. And sometimes they do lash out in that way, unfortunately. What are your thoughts about not providing children any option or way to survive outside of the community? Okay, Emma, that's a very, very important question. Uh, so again, like I said, uh, this community was built with an eye towards um, serving God in the most pure way that they know from their perspective. And for them, it's very important for them to obviate any outside cultural um, or theological influences, okay? To that end, uh, very few, if any, members of that community are going for a higher education, um, but most of them seem to do very, very well. Uh, they, they either work within the community, there's also a vociferous uh, Amazon industry in these communities. Uh, lots of the top sellers actually come from Hasidic communities. Uh, they're very, very resourceful. They're very creative. Uh, they find ways for the most part. Now, what about a young person who, that's just not them, and they want to see what's on the other side of the Berlin Wall as it is. And that's where I think uh, they're lacking tools to navigate that kind of pathway. Um, but I think that for the most part, they, uh, they're okay is what I'm saying. It might be a different model of living, most certainly, uh, but for the most part, they're really doing okay. And they are, they're not just surviving, they're thriving. How can we bridge the widening gulf between the Haredi community and the rest of the Jewish community, especially in Israel, where it threatens to undermine the social fabric of the nation? You know, that's, that's, that's really an extremely important question. I think that we have to start recognizing the truth that we really are all brothers and sisters, that we really are all children of one father, that all of these different divisions, um, they don't talk to our essence. Now I understand we are a very opinionated people. Uh, you know, we have our opinions um, and 
there's also a lot of emotional baggage that comes with this. Um, I think that sometimes less observant Jews kind of resent the more observant Jew because they're like, can't you just shut up already and go away and stop reminding me of what my grandmother wanted me to do some years ago? And, um, and then you have, of course, uh, the more observant Jews who do very unsavory things like, for instance, throw rocks at somebody's car when they're, when they're driving on Shabbat. Now, why would you do that? That not only is that against the law on too many counts for me to, you know, to, to go through now, but why would you do that? And why don't you understand that the Jew is, in the final analysis, the essence, and the mitzvah is something God gives a Jew as an opportunity to connect. But first and foremost, it's kind of like putting the wedding ring and making it more important than the actual relationship. And people just don't understand this. Um, and here I have to say, I just have to say the truth, that the more people would understand the Lubavitcher Rebbe's teachings, the more they would understand this, this, this is the crux of the matter. You know, it's not like do more mitzvot and then God will love you more. God already loves you and gives you the mitzvah as an opportunity to further that relationship. And this truth, unfortunately, is lost on so many. And so there's just so much strife and animosity and it's so unnecessary. And uh, that was part of the reason that, uh, a large part of the reason I'm doing this, because frankly, you know, it's just a TV miniseries. Like everybody relax, right? But, but it, you can see that it's, it's, it's gotten Jewish people's blood roiling. Uh, and so that's why I think it's, it's important, if I can, uh, make a contribution in terms of us understanding each other. Uh, what is the point of Torah observance maintained in such an insular way when surely the central mission of the Jewish people is to bring God and light to the world? Well, <laughs> I, couldn't, uh, I can't agree with you more that the central mission of the Jewish people is to bring God and light to the world. Uh, but, you, you know, like I said, uh, this particular community and many other Hasidic communities and many other ultra-Orthodox communities to some degree um, have not yet found that balance and uh, don't yet feel like they're in a position where they, where they want to kind of take the risk of exposing their children to the copious amounts of, uh, you know, contrary influences that abound in our, in our culture. They run contrary to everything that's most important. Uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe did something radical. He did something unheard of. You know, he sent his Hasidim to live in communities, uh, many of which would be the only observant Jew, forget Hasidic Jew in that community. And, uh, it's, it's not always a walk in the park. It, it's not always so simple. Um, but when you're infused uh, with, with a certain way of understanding things and you're able to see the soul in every person you meet, it, it allows you to kind of navigate uh, the differences and really focus on what we all share. Uh, but it's, it's a difficult thing and not every community has been able to, to find that balance. Uh, if you, like I said before, if it's so important for you to your children, for your children to grow a certain way, it's difficult for you to expose them to all types of noxious influences. And I think everybody here can, can agree with me. Like there are very, very few parents, if, if some of you are parents, who would allow their child, even though they, they trust their child and they believe their child to be a really good kid, but they're not going to allow them to, to go to a party uh, driving with some kid who's been drinking or who's driving a car but doesn't have a license or, or whatever else, right? We all seek to protect our children. Ah. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing it back to my attention. What's something positive that you took away from this series? It's really hard because um, I, I, I felt like there could have been so much more positivity. Uh, you know, you see Esty reaching out to her grandmother. That, that was a real moment. Um, and, and her grandmother, I think, paralyzed by her own terror uh, and, and, and just inability to deal with what happened, 
hangs up on Esty. And, and that's, that's one of the most gut-wrenching scenes in, in, in the miniseries, at least for me. I mean, believe me, I am totally horrified by the bedroom scenes and, and, and so on and so forth uh, on so many levels. But for me, it was gut-wrenching because Esty was reaching out to her grandmother. Now, there's a certain beauty, there's a poignant beauty in that because even as she's run away from the community, and now it seems that everything she wants is at her fingertips, but she so craves to be back in the warm embrace of her grandmother. And so if the reader gets, if the viewer gets that, they get a tiny, tiny glimpse into, you know, a, a very, very, um, distinctive type of, of community and family paradigm uh, that's very, very powerful. And of course, again, because of um, how this was, you know, how this was presented to us, uh, you're already dealing uh, with, you know, an unconventional family, let's just say, and there are very few opportunities to actually see healthy relationships. And there, there you see it. Um, that was very striking to me. Uh, now we're talking. Do you think the situation SD was in could have been avoided? There was more education regarding marital intimacy within the community. Is this a realistic portrayal? Um, I have to be honest with you, friends. I just hope and pray that this is not a realistic portrayal. That's all I have to say. Um, again, I don't doubt uh, that there could be couples who have difficulty. And I'm also not saying that, you know, the kids in the Satmar community are getting your conventional sex education. I'm not saying that, but I would hope that there would be instruction for young people, that it would be instruction that is instructive and allows them to understand that this is a great, that sexuality is a great gift from God, that it's a very important part of life, uh, that it is both to be enjoyed and also to be sanctified, and that there is nothing at all uh, about it that, that needs to feel uncomfortable or not in sync or in consonance uh, with any of the other values that are so important to the community. Uh, so I, I'm going to be honest with you, and I think that they could use a little bit more help in this department. And uh, I, I hope that this was not a realistic depiction. Uh, that's not okay. If, if a young girl is that clueless and she is that naive, uh, you know, to kind of euphemistically <laughs> talk to her is, is, is not helpful. On the other hand, uh, I would have to say that while the education on this area of life might be cryptic and uh, might veer towards kind of euphemistic. I really believe that human beings were created in such a way that they can figure it out, uh, you know, more or less. It might take a little bit longer. It might take a little bit, you know, and I don't want anybody to struggle. Trust me. I don't want my own children to struggle. I don't want any young people in my community to struggle. But, you know, what was depicted was very, very extreme, you know. And, um, Mrs. Sun, uh, can I jump in for a moment? <clears throat> can I jump in for a moment? Because I think it's a great opportunity for you to maybe expound uh, for a minute or two about what is the ideal and optimal view of marital intimacy from the Hasidic community you grew up in and you know very well. That is to say, of course, what has been depicted is an aberration or maybe a departure from uh, mainstream Hasidic life or mainstream Orthodox life. Can you share with us what, what is the optimal uh, vision or, or application of, of intimacy in, in a religious circles? Ever the rabbi uh, trying to get me to give a sermon. All right. <laughs> uh, well, I won't give a sermon, but perhaps a sermonette. Let me say this first. I have had incessant barrage of questions coming my way uh, different iterations of the same question, which is, oh my God, uh, how can these people ever get married? How do observant Jews ever get married? They don't know if they're sexually compatible. How does that work? And while I hear that question, um, in my mind, I'm thinking, based on my own experience, counseling young people for, for over three decades with relationship issues and young couples with relationship issues, I think to myself, oh my God, how do so many people get married without knowing that their values are compatible? 
you know? Um, and, and then they have a chance to grow their relationship from the inside out. Now, if you begin that way with values being aligned and your principles being compatible and having a really clear sense that marriage is extremely important and I'm going to uh, devote myself to this union, I think that the physical aspect will follow. Yes, of course, there's sexual dysfunction, both of the physiological and the psychological variety. But in the main, in the aggregate, I'm not so worried about sexual compatibility. I think people will get it, okay? Now the question is, how do we take this really beautiful gift that God has given us and contextualize it? Because the truth is that sex is what you do and intimacy is who you do it with. And that's what we're looking for. That's really God's unique gift to human beings because every other aspect of creation can mate as well, aside from the inanimate uh, substrata, okay? But human beings are the only ones who can do something beyond that. A lot of people don't realize that, yes, there is a mitzvah to procreate, it's called pru or vu, to be fruitful and multiply. And you heard me correctly. That's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. And it's also not a lifestyle choice. From the perspective of Jewish law, it's an out-and-out -out commandment. But there's a separate commandment for a husband to pleasure his wife sexually. That's one of three basic responsibilities a man has in marriage. It's not a woman's responsibility to service her husband. It's a man's responsibility to make sure that his wife is loved and cherished and uh, achieves and, and enjoys sexual pleasure. But for it to really be pleasurable and deep and intimate, it's about understanding that this is something unique to the bond that they share. And that's not disconnected from the fact that there's so much um, kind of separation between the genders in, in ultra-Orthodox communities. Um, this is really all flowing from an understanding that ultimately what a husband and wife share is so distinct, it's so unique. And by taking any component of it and kind of putting it into the, um, let's just say public thoroughfare, you're cheapening what they have between each other. So really these young people all of their life are, are, are really learning just how potent and how holy and how valuable human touch is. You know, oftentimes I have my dear, dear students who I love to pieces, uh, you know, talking to me and telling me, come on, Rifki, you know, just touching someone, it doesn't mean anyone. Just kissing, it doesn't mean anything. Just kissing someone, it doesn't mean anything. We're just sleeping together, but it doesn't mean anything. And I'm like, wait, hold on a minute. Forget that I'm a Ribbitson, okay? I'm just like, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm really old enough to, you know, I, I have my, I have the, the children of my, my original students are here now with me, okay? Um, so I'm somewhere between a mother, an aunt, or a grandmother to some of my students. I'm like, forget about that I'm observant. Can you just look into my eyes? Because I just want to offer my sincere condolences to you. Because if you're sleeping with someone and it doesn't mean anything, we, re we really have to talk about this. Uh, so from the perspective of Judaism, intimacy is the single holiest thing that two people can engage in. You heard me correctly. Holier than fasting on Yom Kippur and mortgaging your home and your business to charity. It's the holiest thing. It's the opportunity people get to be closest to the divine by becoming one flesh. But to become, really to become one, you have to be able to, to foster a proper context for that. And when sex becomes cheap and touch doesn't mean anything, it's really hard to find um, the depth of intimacy even, even in your own bedroom. Um, I hope that helped a little bit. I'm happy to answer any particular questions. How do you think the highest authority feels about the series? Do you mean God Almighty? Uh, I don't know. She's, she's been pretty silent on this uh, <laughs> last time I spoke to her. But, you know, she created this world in such a way where we get to make choices 
and has given us a lot of strength so we could hang ourselves if we choose. And that's what makes the times that we embrace God that valuable because it's of our own volition, because we've made the choice. So God's not micromanaging us. What subjects do they learn at school? Oh, sex life. Um, I'm not understanding the question. What subjects do they learn at school? Is the sex life accurately portrayed? Oh, I see. Two different questions. Okay. Um, so I think that the, the real um, stress in the school is on the Judaic component. Uh, for the girls, they're getting secular uh, instruction as well. I'm not going to, you know, massage this away. I don't think that the secular instruction is with an eye to getting people into Harvard or Yale. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's okay, all right? Um, for the boys, I think there's much less secular instruction, just a minimum and mostly Judaic instruction. And is the sex life accurately portrayed? Uh, like I said, I, I hope to God it's not accurate. Um, again, my people have um, this kind of miserable experience. Who am I to say not? Um, and my heart goes out to them. But in general, uh, you know, you see two people who have, don't seem to be kissing or embracing or petting or caressing. I mean, these are all aspects of, of lovemaking that are discussed in the Mishnah, they're discussed in the Talmud. I mean, you know, and, 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 and they just come naturally in, in, in the human interaction and the human experience. Uh, so that's why it's really so hard to understand what's going on here unless each one of these young people is bringing so much baggage uh, from another place that it totally impedes their ability to just be natural with each other. Um, and, and really your heart, your heart kind of bleeds for that. Um, but no, I don't think that's an accurate portrayal of what intimacy should be. Um, yes, it's true that, um, you know, you could say that they can fulfill uh, the optimum way to have intimacy, um, which is flesh on flesh with nothing in between by pulling up those nightgowns. Uh, but certainly that's not the ideal. Uh, and I'm going to take this um, opportunity to disabuse anyone of the notion that they do it through a hole in the sheet. Uh, so that is an urban legend. Um, and uh, just throwing that out there if anybody was suffering from that erroneous idea. Uh, no, I, I don't think that's, that's a um, accurate portrayal. Look, I, th they're coming to marriage with sexual inexperience. And so is every Chabad, um, you know, every Chabad couple uh, is, is coming to marriage with sexual inexperience. And you know what? I am proud to say that because in my book, I think that um, the sweetest, most delicious aspect of intimacy is that journey, is that exploration, is that moment where you're like, what? There can't be anybody who has figured out to do this with the person they love, right? Um, and, and what I see all around me is, is the opposite. It's like everybody's so jaded. It's like there's this list and they've already done this and this and this and this with this boyfriend and that boyfriend and that boyfriend. It's almost like, how do I feel anything? And then you have to get toys and then you have to get lingerie and then you have to light candles and then you have to watch pornography together and you have to do God knows what to feel anything. Um, so sexual experience is a great gift. Now, obviously, when you take it to an extreme where you literally don't have any clue of what end is up or down, that's problematic. That's not, you know, what I'm getting behind at all here. Do you think that the Hasidic communities contribute into the public purse as much as they take out? Um, that, that's a really, really important question. I don't sit on any of the councils that Governor Cuomo has uh, now convened to reimagine New York after this pandemic. Um, but I will say this. What a lot of people would never know, certainly not from watching this miniseries, but a lot of people might know this in any case, is all the good, all the kindness, all the unabashed selflessness that comes out of a lot of communities just like this. Um, I'm going to speak to New York City because I'm more familiar with that than, you know, London, for instance. And I'm, I don't know what happened there. But I could tell you that in New York City, uh, there is a major electronics uh, uh, 
business that's owned, that's, uh, that's, Hasid, that's Hasidically owned, for lack of a better word. I'm not sure uh, which Hasidic sect, okay? But this business gave away, gave away over a thousand iPads indiscriminately to people of any color creed um, so that they could communicate with their loved ones from the hospital. But they not only gave them away, they spent copious amounts of time in each hospital hooking these iPads up and don't think it was such an easy thing to get into the hospital. So they had to pull all kinds of what uh, Jews like to call protexia to get into these hospitals. And they didn't do it for their own family. They did it to help anybody in the hospital who didn't have a cell phone, who didn't have a working way to communicate with their loved ones outside of the, fam outside of the, ho of the hospital. They've been running around giving out sandwiches to nurses and food galore and so on and so forth. So I think that's really important to take into the equation of are they giving back to the public what they're taking out? And how do you put a value on bringing beautiful children into this world? Children who live quite decent lives. Children who, for the most part, 90, let's just, let's just say probably over 90% of them are not going to become criminals, drug addicts, and so on and so forth. They're going to become purposeful citizens of the country and the, and the place they live in. Uh, so I think that needs to be taken into the, um, into the equation. But more and more are actually in the, you know, they're working. And so they're contributing the same amount of taxes as anyone else at this point. Uh, what's the biggest challenge you personally encounter in living your life as a religious Jew? And what is the one lesson or reflection from this discussion that you would want each of us to reflect upon? I'm going to take the second part first. Every time I watch a show about observant Jews, it reminds me that when I watch something about another group of people that I am not really, really familiar with, that I really need to do my homework, that I really speak, to, I need to speak to someone from inside that community. I need to read, I need to study because it's just so easy uh, to ingest these biases just through osmosis. You don't even realize what an imprint it makes on your mind. And um, art is very, very powerful. It's very, very powerful. Um, you know, TV series, movies, these can be very powerful ways to understand new things. Uh, but something I really, really learned over the years is that you have to be really careful um, and not draw sweeping conclusions, you know, from what, what you're looking at in the drama. Um, what's the biggest challenge I personally encounter? Honestly, I consider myself a very privileged person. Um, really, I've been very, very blessed and I can't really... I think um, you know, if I had to look back, it, it, it wasn't always easy raising a, a large family of Hasidic children um, in, in a location where we were for a very long time the only Hasidic Jews. Uh, but I thank God every day for this opportunity and privilege. And I feel that my children have been so enriched by our community and uh, gifted with the various exposures and uh, influences that they've had. Um, but, you know, there were times where it was uh, tricky. What everyone took away, I found the, the spoken Yiddish beautiful and so rare to hear on screen. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Gary. I understand what you said about the hierarchy not necessarily being separated by men and women, and that we all live in a hierarchical structure. However, in the Haredi communities, Judaism in general, except reform and communities, only men can be rabbis, and therefore, by default, there is gender inequality. How does this align with your interpretations of feminism? Okay, that's a really, really important question. Um, there's so many things I could say, and uh, I can only say one at a time. So uh, let's begin. Uh, I once heard uh, Malka Bina, who's a great scholar of Talmud, uh, one of the greatest uh, female scholars of Talmud alive today, uh, speak. She was being interviewed. And she said, how do you feel about the fact that, you know, this is your area, uh, and yet there are no other, there are very few female voices. There are only two females uh, that are quoted in the Talmud. There are others that are mentioned, but there's really only Bruria and Yalta. And how do you feel about that? And uh, she replied, and I think that she was very on point. She said, look, when the Talmud was written, uh, there weren't women engaged in any discipline at that time. It's not just the Talmud. 
okay? That was just the way things were. And I'm not going to throw away this glorious um, area of study because there are no women mentioned there, you know? Uh, so I think that that's important for us to remember. And that allows us to reflect on the fact that life has changed. We've moved uh, from a sociological reality where um, there was very little time really for women to engage in any type of study. It took almost all the time and energy to run a house. Um, and in, in Jewish life, uh, this was one of the reasons that there wasn't a formal structure for female education. The other being that while women have an absolute uh, responsibility to learn all the Torah they need to know to live robust Jewish lives and to be in a flourishing relationship with their creator, but they don't have the same mitzvah that men have, which is an ongoing, unremitting, uninterrupted study of Torah, unless they're doing something that is absolutely necessary, okay? And that is for a larger reason, uh, women are excused from positive time-bound mitzvot, one of which is the study of Torah unceasingly, okay? But since in Judaism, women's uh, privilege and responsibility has always been to be the anchor of the home, not to be confused with housekeeping. This is about being the definitive and defining influence in the home. Um, you can't really make a person responsible in two different directions at the same time. And so that gave way to a situation where women did not have formal schooling uh, for a long time, even though formal schooling for Jewish boys goes back into antiquity. We Jews have probably had the first public school system in the entire world, uh, but that's a subject for another day. Uh, so when it went with the Enlightenment, when it became clear that life was changing, women had more time, uh, that it just wasn't enough for women to just uh, kind of get all of their education at home and hearth. And at the same time, they were going for education in secular matters and that inequity really didn't bode well. That was when uh, schools came to the fore, organized educational structures for Jewish women. Um, and then it took some time uh, for how these would be organized and what they would pay attention to first. Uh, now we're at a point where um, in many, many schools, Jewish women's education is on par with the education that men are getting. There are still communities. Satmar would be one. Well, Satmar is really actually uh, distinctive in that in their particular community, women, girls never even see the inside of a chumash. They never even see the inside of a Bible. Um, in other communities, you won't have girls or women learning Mishnah or Talmud and the codes and so on and so forth. And I agree that that would ipso facto create an imbalance in power because education and knowledge is power. Um, but that's changing too. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was a great proponent of women uh, studying any aspect of the Torah that would further strengthen their relationship with God, would foster love of God and fear of God. And that could include Mishnah and Talmud and Kabbalah and, and any other aspect of the Torah that might not be uh, traditionally available to women in other communities. So how does this gender inequality align with my feminism? Uh, you know what? Who's asking? Hannah? Hannah, I'm, I'm going to read something for you. I don't usually do this, but um, allow me. You know, sometimes uh, you find things in, in the most unexpected of places. Uh, so I really don't remember, you know, uh, people love to throw in that I'm like a Hasidic feminist as if that's supposed to be something so sensationalist and, of course, in the UK, controversial. Um, but I, I really don't understand what the big deal is. But I do know that when this first happened, I think what happened is that somebody was interviewing me and they asked me if I was a feminist and I said yes. And the next thing I knew, I had um, like all my good friends calling me to say, are you sure you really want to identify as such? And are people going to want to marry your children, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that was one really, one reaction. And then the other, the other part of the reaction came from outside the community. How dare you call yourself a Hasidic feminist? That's oxymoronic. And and that's impossible and they're mutually exclusive. And it's almost like, whoa, like, really? Talk about hierarchy? I don't get a chance to express myself the way I want. Uh, and and I, you know, I just like to read all kinds of stuff. And one day I was reading a book by Ellen Willis 
It's called Radical Feminism and Feminist Radicalism. And uh, she describes a, a conversation she was having with a very observant woman. And here I quote, she says, the big lie of male supremacy is that women are less than fully human. The basic task of feminism is to expose that lie and fight it on every level. Yet for all my feminist militants, I was, it seemed, secretly afraid that the lie was true, that my humanity was hopelessly at odds with my intellectual female sexuality. While the Rebitson, staunch apostle of traditional femininity, did not appear to doubt for a moment that she could be both a woman and a serious person which was only superficially paradoxical, for if you are absolutely convinced that the Jewish woman's role was ordained by God, and that it was every bit as important spiritually as the man's, how could you believe the lie? So do I recognize that there's an inequality and that um, because men have had access to the repository of of Jewish knowledge, there's going to be a lot of power in that, that most women don't have, although very, 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 very slowly it's changing. Um, I do recognize that. But here's the real question. Is that the only thing a Jewish community needs to go forward? Absolutely not. So in my book, feminism is about both males and females shining their particular light. I don't know how it is for you, but in the States here, more and more families are giving their daughters bat mitzvahs at the age of 13. You heard me correctly. Why at the age of 13? Because if little boys get bar mitzvahs at the age of 13, that must be better, right? They are completely oblivious to the fact that according to Jewish law, a little girl becomes a full-fledged woman in some respects. She becomes responsible for Jewish law at age 12, a full year before a boy, because she because there's, there's recognition that she matures earlier. But somehow this is lost on everyone. Ah, it must be better if the boys have their bar mitzvah at age 13. If you ask me, that is the greatest light to feminism. The, the constant, constant, need to imitate male modalities and to not be able to celebrate the female modality. I've yet to see men clamoring to get a doily on their heads and put their hands like this three times and, and light Shabbat candles. As if really it's that much fun and it's so sexy to get an aliyah. Like really? Let's be real here. Like what is this? Um, so that's a little bit of how it aligns with my interpretation of feminism. Let me put it this way. Judaism can definitely be described as patriarchal. No question about it. But then there's this little stickler of a detail that you're only Jewish if your mother is Jewish, which would kind of make Judaism matriarchal. But the truth of the matter is, it's neither patriarchal or matriarchal, it's covenantal. And that's what people can't seem to bend their brain around. It's not about us, dummy. I don't mean you personally. It's about God. It's about something higher. And when we can use that as a point of departure, a lot of other things become clear. Uh, maybe you know the story, but if you don't, even if there's one person on this call that doesn't, you, you owe yourself to know the story. So when Henry Kissinger uh, became Secretary of State, this was a very big deal that a Jew finally made it to the inner cabinet you know, of the US government. This was before Joe Lieberman was gonna run for vice presidential candidate as a Sabbath observant Jew, no less. It was before Al Gore introduced him at, the, at that year's Democratic National Convention and said that he was proud to say he was he was Joe Lieberman's Shabbos guy, okay? You see what I'm saying? Uh, it was a different world back then. And uh, Golda Meir was then the prime minister of the state of Israel, and she sent Henry Kissinger uh, uh, an effusive um, telegram of congratulations. And Kissinger got very nervous that with this, she was kind of trying to curry special favors for the then nascent state of Israel. So he wrote back 
uh, to her very quickly saying, thank you very much uh, for your kind congratulations, Madam Prime Minister, but I just want you to know, I am first an American, second a diplomat, and third a Jew. To which she very quickly fired back, delighted with your communique, as you know, in Israel we read from right to left. Um, and, I, and I raised this vignette, not only because I'm a really big fan of Golda Meir, and I could tell you stories uh, for, for hours, uh, but because I want to make a certain point. And I, with this, I'm circling back to the very first point I made. If you want to understand, you have to read from right to left, as it were. You have to understand within a context. And um, kind of superficially uh, bringing a lens from a different culture and putting it as an overlay on a completely different culture, you, you're just not going to get a proper reading. It's going to be skewed in very, very profound ways. Oh, thank you so much, we, we, have, uh, we have time for one last question, but just before doing so, first I want to share with you the humorous quip. Maybe you're familiar with it. You mentioned Joe Lieberman. When Joe Lieberman failed to get <clears throat> to be elected, he came home rather depressed. And when he came home, his wife asked him, Joe, what's the problem? He said, well, I, uh, I, I failed. I, I was not elected vice president, to which she said, honey, in this home, you will always be vice president. The final question from Jessica Cohen. Could you please explain the symbolism behind the shaving of the head after marriage? And also, she clearly had vaginism. Is it not common for girls to be followed by a gynecologist? Um, I think that uh, that community avails itself of, of doctors to the same extent that any other community avails itself. Um, but it's also possible that that kind of pathology would not manifest before somebody's sexually active. Um, so would not necessarily come to the attention of the girl or her physician. Uh, concerning the shaving of the head after marriage. Uh, so let me just try to uh, kind of preface this by saying that whatever I tell you, and I will give you the two reasons why the women of that community shave their head, and there are women in other Hasidic communities who do so. And if you're wondering about your Chabad Rebetzin, I can tell you that there's a really, really uh, abysmal chance that she shaves her head. Um, it's actually something the Rebbe said was not a good idea to do. However, um, having said that, it is common in certain Hasidic communities. And I'm going to give you the reasons. And immediately you're going to say that is ridiculously extreme. And so I want to say a word before I give you the reasons, okay? I have noticed that um, when people expend a lot of passion about almost anything in life, there's always a positive way to frame it. So if somebody's spending $800 on a bottle of wine, Oh, they're a connoisseur. And if they're spending $360 on a round of cheese, well, that's a gourmand. $3 million on a piece of art, a patron of arts. Uh, $3,000 on the last tickets to a ball game, aficionado, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on for quite a while, but I'll cut it right now. You, you, you see what I'm saying? But when somebody gets a little passionate about observance, there's only one word extreme, ultra, mishuga. You see a pattern here? So before I give you the reasons, and, and, you, and I understand that you will come to the conclusion that this is extreme, and I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying that there is a lot of passion in ultra-Orthodox communities uh, for observance. It's not seen as an annoyance. It's not like, oh my God, I got to do this. Or how do I find a way out? It's the opposite. This is my way in, in my relationship with God. And so like anything else you really care about, you're going to try to do it in the most careful way you can. Uh, so why do women in these communities shave their heads? There are two reasons. One is because there is a commandment that a married woman has to cover her hair. Uh, a lot of people actually don't realize that this is biblical in origin, at the very least to cover the crown of her head. And then there are rabbinic overlays that make it necessary for her to cover all of her hair, okay? Now, if you really are concerned with having any of the hair exposed, there are many ways to cover the hair. 
But if you shave the head, you're never gonna have to worry about a hair being exposed. Extreme, yes, but it's their custom, okay? The second thing this is connected to is that one of the most important of all biblical commandments and one of the most important of all observances in Jewish life is immersion in the mikvah by a woman on a monthly basis after she has her period, during which time and until after which she goes to visit the mikvah, she and her husband are not being physically intimate. And in order for this immersion to be halachically valid, in order for it to be kosher, the water has to envelop every aspect of her body. And if even one here floats above the water, it invalidates the immersion. Are there many ways of taking care of this problem? <laughs> yes, there are. But if you shave your hair, you're not gonna have to worry about hair floating on top of the water. Now, again, the good news is nobody is asking anybody to shave their head. This is their communal custom, okay? Having said that, I think it's really important to listen to what I just said their communal custom. And if you noticed in, the, in that scene, there were little girls watching as her aunt shaved Esty's head. They, they, this is part of life. This is organic. And um, I know people think that this is horrendous and harkens back to the Holocaust. And how could a community that was so uh, severely impacted by the Holocaust do this to their women? But listen to what I'm saying. I'm just repeating, do this to their women. It makes women sound like they're in cages and people are shaving their heads. Women are shaving their own heads or they're shaving each other's heads. This is their communal norm. Uh, they grow up this way. They expect this. And they experience this as a rite of passage. And I know that that's really, really hard to understand when you've never seen that before. And I respect that. I, I, I totally agree. Um, but that's, that's what's going on there. Let me conclude with, with, uh, with one joke, perhaps. Um, I started with a joke. Let me conclude with a joke. Yes. Um, we and then we're going to, and that's some words of thanks. So this is a joke about two men who meet on the street. And one of them says to his friend, Rappaport, you changed so much. Look at you. You lost weight, you got a facelift, you even got a hair transplant. I wouldn't have known it's you. The other fellow says, I'm not Rappaport. To which the first guy says, look at that. You even changed your, your name. And I, sh I share that because I think it's a bookend on a very interesting discussion. And I actually found everything enlightening, but especially so the positive you took out from the discussion, which is it cautions us and sensitizes us to really see nuance to see within the knee jerk to, to to resist the knee jerk temptation and reaction to organize people by generalizations and also to stop projecting our own sense or absolute certainty about what is the only measure of truth or value or correct a way of living based on our personal bias and disposition so on that note i want to thank you so much for your time and for your energy and your insight it's really been a privilege and a pleasure. And we want to conclude by blessing everyone on this Zoom session. And of course, yourself with continued good health, prosperity, serenity, peace of mind. Want, want to wish you all good health, stay safe, and all good things.